it's been uh, good to look at the uh, life of David, and uh, we've, we're going to leave that now for some time. But I want to uh, today look at a psalm of David, and this is Psalm 37. Uh, this, uh, I found this psalm particularly helpful for me, and I hope it's helpful for you during this time. And I'm going to invite Miriam now to come and read that to us. She's just going to read the first 24 verses. Psalm 37. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord and trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carried out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend the bow to bring down the poor and needy, to slay those whose ways are upright. But their swords will pierce their own hearts, and their bows will be broken. Better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked. For the power of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The blameless spend their days under the Lord's care, and their inheritance will endure forever. In times of disaster, they will not wither. In days of famine, they will enjoy plenty. But the wicked will perish, though the Lord's enemies are like flowers of the field. They will be consumed. They will go up in smoke. The wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous give generously. Those the Lord blesses will inherit the land. But those he curses will be destroyed. The Lord makes firm steps of the one he delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. This is the word of the Lord. This psalm begins with the line, do not fret. Well, David didn't know my life and uh, hadn't heard my worries. Let me count them one by one. There's much to worry about, isn't there? We see husbands, fathers, mothers, wives who abandon their families. I worry about what our children are being taught deliberately. I also worry about what they're picking up from the garbage available through their internet devices, through the TV. Very little is being done to protect schools, libraries and families. I worry about what I eat. I don't know who makes our food and what's really in it. I look at the, the poor and the world and see much oppression. It worries me that the person who advertises for the shoe makes more money than all the people who make the shoe combined. There's much uh, chipping away at the sanctity of life, at the edges of, and margins of life. Young babies are killed before they have a chance at life and older people are encouraged to end it early. There's a decline of fatherhood. Fathers are ridiculed, irrelevant and often irresponsible. In 2010 in Victoria, the law was changed to allow single women and lesbian couples to obtain donor sperm in Victoria. And almost half of the 
Over a thousand women who received sperm donor treatment in Victoria were single. Fathers are optional. I look at the church and the church has moved from being an organisation that was seen as irrelevant to an organisation that was dangerous, despised, even an enemy. I look at the media elite. I see their bias and prejudice. I see agendas being pushed. I see groups looking to overthrow society, just waiting until the right enablements. I see a redefining of language. Words like gay marriage. You can take each of those words, take it as a, as a, as a phrase, euphemisms for something else. Safe sex, safe schools, all euphemisms for something very different. Leadership is disappointing. Leadership disappoints even in the ones we hope are going to do well and we think are going to do well. There is injustice amongst the police, amongst judges, corruption in politics, even abuse amongst the clergy. I see churches increasingly not using the Bible or not taking the Bible seriously. And then there is my own unrelenting private struggles, our struggles in our families, workplaces, not just with our sin, and the, uh, we also have to deal with the sins of others. This year was going to be a new decade. Who could have seen uh, the, the effect of the virus? There's this whole balance between killing the economy and killing people. and You can't meet for a funeral of more than 20 people, yet you can protest in cr crowds of 20,000. And I look at our young people. They're big on outrage and small on answers and certainly small on the details. And it's not just children these days. I could go on, but you get the idea, and I'm sure you have your own list. And yet David says to us, in the word of God, he says, do not fret. In this psalm, written as, as an acrostic, uh, A to Z, uh, in the Hebrew, each line would start with the letter of the alphabet, and it was, it was written to, to be remembered. It was important. And David here is writing against the backdrop of his own situation. Writing against, against the backdrop of enemies that have risen up. Not just the Philistines, but even members of his own family. And he tells us in verse 1, Do not fret because of those who are evil. To fret is a, a word in the Hebrew that means to glow or grow warm. To be angry, to burn. Fred is not to be disappointed. Uh, Fred is not even to be worried or even sad. It's a step beyond that. It's a giving in or a giving over to worry or anger or despair. It's to surrender to worry. Do not fret, says David, and do not be envious of those who do wrong. Do not be envy of those who are given prominence and status, who appear to have success and be part of the winning team, and yet are full of evil. Do not be envy, envious of those who do wrong. And you might say well, it's all very well for David to say that, but hasn't he sent my list? And before we get on to why we shouldn't give ourselves to worry, I want to address those of you who are patting yourselves on the back because you don't worry. You don't worry about anything. You're the quintessential expression of the Aussie, Aussie phrase, no worries, mate. Let me say at the outset that if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, then it is no credit to you if you are untouched by worry. It is no mark of spirituality if you live a life that is aloof, uninvolved, or unmoved. As Christians, we should be full of compassion and concerned about injustice and devastated when the honour of God's name has been maligned. Jesus himself, the Prince of Peace, looked over Jerusalem and wept. On the other hand, 
unconsoled worry or despair is not the right alternative. In this psalm, we see that fretting, burning, is not an acceptable sin. John Wesley said, I do not fret any more that I dare curse or swear. Why shouldn't we fret or envy? And the answer David gives is not Pollyannaish. The answer is not to minimize the state of things. The answer is do not worry, be happy. There's much more substance and empowerment here than that. I was encouraged by the reasons David gives in this psalm. And I got 12 of them. And I hope you'll find these helpful too. So I encourage you to uh, have your Bibles open and see what David says. This is the inspired word of God and this is God's word to us. Firstly, in verse 2, do not fret because evil has an expiry date. Verse 2, like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Evil will not, it cannot endure. Proverbs 24 verse 19 says, Do not fret because of evildoers or be envious of the wicked. For the evildoer has no future hope and the lamp of the wicked will be snuffed out. In this psalm in verse 20, we read, The wicked will perish. Though the Lord's enemies are like flowers of the field, they will be consumed, they will go up in smoke. And so rather than destroying themselves with negative emotions, the godly must keep things in perspective. Anger, resentment, and jealousy destroy faith in God's goodness and justice and affect our attitude to everything. I love the, the turnaround we see in Psalm 73, where the psalmist says, I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Uh, they clothe themselves with violence. And uh, this is what the wicked are like, he says, always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. And when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. And then, verse 17 of, chapters of Psalm 73, I entered the sanctuary of God and I understood their final destiny. It's cold now, but spring is coming. The uh, Tyndale commentary entitles the psalm, Wait Patiently for Him. Evil will not, it cannot endure. Secondly, in verse 3, God reminds us that you are not alone. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Whatever we face, we don't face it on our own. Trust in the Lord. Jesus promises and he says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Thirdly, verse 4, you will be fulfilled. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Trust in him. I remember 30 years ago, I think it is a long time ago, uh, in the early 90s, uh, when I was preparing to go to Turkey and uh, a friend of mine who was an atheist had, had just had come to faith and uh, she grew so fast uh, in the things of God. She was such an encouragement and uh, it got to a point where she was preparing to come with us to Turkey and as part of that uh, she needed approval by her elders and she went to her elders uh, and uh, asked for their confirmation and, and uh, support and approval and they said, uh, advised her that because she was young in the faith, she should leave it for a while and, uh, and maybe do this later. Uh, my response at the time, not a very godly response, was find another church. But she trusted that God was sovereign. And she took the advice of her elders. And so while I was in Turkey, she stayed here. And, and during that time, she met her husband. And uh, she got married and... God sustained her and God looked after her. And uh, she's gone into, on into all sorts of great ministry. John Piper says that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. So God promises that we will find fulfillment in him. And then fourthly, verse 5, God hears you. Know that God hears you. Commit your ways 
to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. God has, expects his children uh, to be his children, to put themselves completely under his fatherly care, to trust in the waiting Lord to act. He calls us to look up. Now, as we go through this, I don't want to add another worry that maybe you're worried about worrying, fretting about fretting. The point of all this is that worry and worship are mutually exclusive. David calls us to look up, look up to our Father. Psalm 6 verse 8 says, Away from me, all you who do, do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. This is the great reminder that even in the thick of our, fret, of our fretting, we never find God indifferent or helpless or caught by surprise. And that even when it seems like no one else hears that our friends have all deserted us, we can agree with David who says these words in the previous psalm. He says, All my longings lay open before you, Lord. My sighing is not hidden from you. And so we have a God who hears. And fifthly, verse 6, we have a God who will vindicate. Verse 6, he will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Like the rising sun at dawn and the bright light at noon. God promises to bring things to their rightful conclusion, to bring justice, to wipe away every tear. I remember some friends of mine who were translating the Bible uh, in, in PNG. And they'd spent years on it. I don't know how many years, maybe 20 years. And they'd got to that point where they were ready to, to have the Bible printed and given to the people they'd been working with. And so they went to get permission from the new archbishop uh, for this Bible to be done and for a ceremony, ceremony to be had. And the new archbishop, who didn't know them so well, uh, refused permission because they had not used his favorite translation, the Revised Standard Version, done in 19, I don't know, sometime in the, in the 20th century. Instead, they'd gone back to the original Greek and translated it. I couldn't believe it. Their work was being hindered by uh, this bishop who uh, had these crazy ideas and preferences. And I asked him, how did you cope? He said, well, I, I'm not anxious. He said, I've done what I was called to do. I've been faithful. I've done uh, what God has asked me to do. This is God's problem. This is God's business. God will vindicate. And sure enough, in time, the door was opened and the translation was done. Further on in the psalm, we read, The Lord will not leave them in the power of the wicked or let them be condemned when brought to trial. Sixthly, we shouldn't fret because it doesn't end there. When we give ourselves over to worry, it leads only to evil. Verse 8 says, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. Watch out and be wary of where worry leads. Worry grows and it spreads and infects. One writer put it like this, worry is a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind if encouraged, it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. A seventh reason we should not fret is because we have an inheritance. Those who are evil, verse 9, will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found, but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Gavin Ortland says that panic and pessimism are out of order for a worldview anchored in belief in an omnipotent God, irresistible grace, and an eternal heaven, heaven. When we worry, we're really thinking about the wrong things. It's a, it's a failure to think. Lloyd-Jones says the essence of worry is the absence of thought, a failure to think. 
And David here urges us to think, to look ahead, to remember what God has in store for his people. Uh, Further on in the psalm, verse 27, Turn from evil and do good, then you will dwell in the land forever. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. Wrongdoers will be completely destroyed. The offspring of the wicked will perish. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. These verses speak of the sovereignty of God. If God is not sovereign, we are hopeless. But our hope comes from a God who is the Lord of history. And so remember your inheritance. Remember what God has in store for you. Another reason we shouldn't worry and give ourselves to worry, eighthly, is that it is expected. It's normal. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. Here we have the expression of godlessness that increasingly describes modern culture. It's an obsession with evil and a hatred of good. People are often surprised when non-Christians act like non-Christians. Could you imagine if people were truly consistent with their beliefs? If, If people were truly consistent with their beliefs, could you imagine what this world would be? I'm just glad that people don't actually live up to what they believe. Uh, I've read the Quran, and those who take it truly seriously, uh, there's there's real trouble. Uh, Those who believe in evolutionary atheism, that we all evolved from from pond scum and it's survival of the fittest. Could you imagine if people actually live like that? I I love what Brother Brother Lawrence said. He, He wrote in the book, Practicing the Presence of God. He was asked, aren't you worried about the state of the world? And he answered, well, with the state of men's hearts, I'm just amazed and thankful that it's not worse. This is to be expected. We're told over and over again in the New Testament and the Old Testament that trouble is part of the the package, and particularly for those who seek to be godly. 1 Peter 4.12, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Do not be surprised, 1 John 3.13, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. And ninthly, and this is important, we shouldn't fret because God is not fretting. Can you imagine the implication if God was fretting, if God was saying, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen, I don't know what we'll do. Verse 13, we're told the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. Psalm 2 verse 4 says, the one enthroned in heaven scoffs at them. And we need to remember God's promise about the future to be certain to us that we pick up his sense of humour. Because God is not fretting, then we need not fret. Tenthly, we see in verses 14 and 15 that evil backfires. The wicked draw the sword and bend the bow to bring down the poor and needy to slay those whose ways are upright but their swords will pierce their own heart and their bows will be broken. You would have heard recently about uh, Dylan Roof who entered a black church and killed many of those in the church. It was a massacre. And he was uh, given an opportunity to hear from the people that he sought to wipe out. And each each of them, one by one, forgave him. He hoped to uh, increase hatred and yet they forgave him. And even when it seems that God has, has forsaken them, when the wicked hold power and pervert justice, as in Nazi Germany, or ISIS, or, or other things that seem to, to have a hold, God promises to establish justice and to rid the earth of evil. I've read the book, God Wins, and uh, we need to remind ourselves of that. Evil will backfire. Number 11, God promises a sustaining grace. Verse 18, the blameless spend their days under the Lord's care and their inheritance will endure forever. The wicked have a day of reckoning. Verse 13, their day is coming. But God's children spend their days under the Lord's care and have an inheritance that will endure forever. Verse 19 says, in times of disaster they will not wither. In days of famine they will enjoy plenty. Hudson Taylor, the 
the missionary to China used to say there are three stages in every great work of God. First it is impossible, then it is difficult, then it is done. Verse 24 says, Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Uh, in, in verse 30, The mouth of the righteous utter wisdom, and their tongue speaks what is just. The law of their God is in their hearts. Their feet do not slip. The children of God then are not a, immune to the experience of alienation and the groaning of this world. But there is God's promise that he will not completely forsake his own. Uh, losing ourselves in worry is a kind of idolatry. Uh, one writer says that worry is faith in the negative, trust in the unpleasant, assurance of disaster and belief in defeat. God sustains his people. Even though they walk through the valley of darkness, he promises to be with them. And twelfthly, he doesn't just sustain but he brings a grace that overflows. And so in their struggles, God's people don't just receive grace, but they receive grace that overflows that they're able to give to others. And uh, there's all these promises in this psalm uh, in verses 21, 25, and 26 about uh, the righteous giving generously, the righteous being generous. Uh, the wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous give generously, verse 21. Verse 26, they are always generous and lend freely. Their children will be a blessing. Uh, this is the same thing we see in 2 Corinthians, uh, where we have this mix of trial and yet overflowing generosity. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. Christians are odd. In the midst of adversity, they can forgive, they can give, they can sing, and they can even laugh with joy. And so we have in the psalm 12 reasons not to fret, and I hope they've, they've encouraged you. At the end of these this psalm, in the last few verses, verses 39 and 40, David puts it all together. Listen to these verses that tie it all up. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Notice that David does not say, the Lord helps those who help themselves. But help is promised to those who take refuge in him. We're encouraged to take the long view. Uh, note that the help comes from him and in him. His initiative in sending and our response in taking shelter, the help that he gives and the refuge that he gives. And so in this psalm, we're, we're encouraged to look back to see creation, to see our salvation, to see our deliverance and to have faith going forward. We're encouraged to look up to all the things that surround and that they might, uh, all the troubles that are around us, that they might become shadows in the light of God. And we're told to look ahead to when justice will reign, to reward and all that God has prepared, to wait patiently. And I finished with those wonderful words of Jesus who said, Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you that you are not a, an unpassionate God. You are not a, an unmoved God. That you take trouble and injustice seriously. But we, there is no reason that we need to be given over to it. We do have trouble. But you call us not to be given over to it because you are sovereign. You have done so much for us and you have so much prepared for us. You are the Lord of history. And we thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have. And we thank you for your very dear presence that sustains us. 
Lord, help us to remember all that you have done for us. Help us to remember your mighty presence and sustaining power with us. And help us to look forward and to remember that all that you have planned for us and for your world. And help us to look forward when Jesus to that time when Jesus returns, when every knee will bow, when he will be revealed as King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' name.